Hi, good day, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, welcome to this new webinar on the transmission lines and SVC. So again, tonight I will, uh, today, tonight for us, uh, I will have uh, my colleague, Gonzalo Mora, uh, helping me answering your questions and uh, relaying the questions if they are of general interest. Good evening, uh, Gonzalo. Good evening, uh, Christian. And, uh, good morning for the South Pacific in Asia. Welcome back to our webinars. So yes, I'm going to be helping this, uh, this day with the chats and the questions. So please don't hesitate to ask anything. I will try to answer all the questions. And if I don't have the right answer, I will just pass it to Christian. Welcome again. And Christian, we may start. Thank you. So we are expecting uh, quite a bit of people. We have about half of the people uh, online right now. Uh, so uh, while we wait for the other people to join us, I will just uh, ask you a couple of questions through polls so I can uh, orient my uh, presentation. So first, uh, I will ask you if you are familiar with the concept of uh, voltage regulation on transmission lines. Uh, once again, for those of you who are familiar, you will know that some of you, unfortunately, will not be able to click on the answers, uh, but about half of you are able to answer, so uh, sorry for those who can't provide their answer. So good, uh, we have a, a knowledgeable crowd tonight. Uh, most of you are somewhat yes. familiar with the concept. Mm -hmm. So that's good, I will be able then to, uh, and, and the, the rest is totally familiar, so I will be able to go quickly over the, the topic and uh, jump more quickly in the hand, hands-on part of the, uh, of the presentation. Perfect. So uh, thank you for answering. Uh, still some people are voting. Oh, 70% of you were able to vote. And I think that's a record tonight. Oh, yeah. Super. Thank you. And then uh, I will provide you with the next question, which is about the second topic of, uh, of today, uh, which is uh, the static VAR compensa compensator technology. So I would like to know who of you are familiar with the concept. Probably less. It's a newer technology. It's about half and a half people, not not at all, or somewhat some knowledge of the topic. Well, that's good. Now we're going to learn something new that's pleasant as well. Yeah, that's good. So I will go uh, quickly over the first part about the transmission lines, and uh, then we will be able to spend more time on the SVC. You will see that the way the presentation is, uh, thank you for answering. I will now close the poll. So you will see that uh, tonight uh, the presentation is divided in two parts. So, so the first part will be on trans uh, regu uh, voltage regulation on transmission lines, and the second part will be on SVC. And the two will be uh, separated by a video because in fact for this presentation, since the equipment required to do the uh, exercise uh, could not be brought home because they required three phase power and they are too big. Uh, we had to go to the uh, to our office to record on the uh, official equipment and then we present the hands-on part through uh, two videos so one on transmission lines and one on SVC but the uh, commentary everything everything about theory will be done uh, verbally live. So Let's now start, uh, where are we in terms of attendees? Yeah, that's good. So we'll now start with uh, the first part and the PowerPoint. So by the way, you will find in the handout section again, the PowerPoints I will be uh, using in this uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, please uh, download it if, uh, if you want. So.
transmission lines and SVC. Uh, so I just told you verbally the, the it will be about uh, you know 15 minutes of presentation on this, 15 minutes of video, then another 15 minutes on SVC, another 15 minutes of video, something like that, with some uh, time for questions and answers, of course, as usual. So uh, first of all, transmission lines. So the main purpose of transmission lines, of course, is to transfer electrical power from where it is generated, usually a power generating mm -hmm. station, be it uh, thermal, uh, nuclear, uh, hydropower, as we can see here. Then uh, to send it on the transmission lines, we will upscale the voltage that comes out from the generators because uh, we want to have as high voltage as possible because it will reduce the current for the same amount of power and thus uh, it will reduce the uh, copper losses in the wires so we want to have as high a voltage as possible so we'll step it up to a, a really high voltage in the 100k range uh, then it will be sent uh, on the transmission network to be stepped down at the other end when it reaches the substation that will feed the various uh, the various industries and uh, homes at the other end so the step down transformer will bring it back to a manageable voltage for distribution and then from distribution voltage it will be brought down to uh, home residential uh, voltage so 220 volt or 120 volt depending on which part of the world you're in so that's the goal of transmission lines when we discuss transmission lines we always refer to the sender end which is the power generating station end and the receiver end where the power is consumed. So we will be constantly using sender and receiver terms uh, throughout this presentation. So uh, to be able to analyze the transmission lines and how it uh, impacts the flow of power on the line, we make a, ma a simple uh, electrical model for it, okay? And here you have the mathematical, not mathematical, but the uh, the simplified model of a transmission line. So at the top here, you can see that the transmission line, of course, has some resistance because it's made of copper, and it has also some inductance because of the fact that there are multiple wires beside another, and there are uh, uh, current loops inside the wires, which create kind of an inductance uh, response of the wire. So this is the natural resistance and inductance of the wire itself. And on top of that, since a transmission line is made of a conductor and it runs above the ground, which is also a conductor, uh, then it, and between the two is a dielectric, so a uh, isolator, the air. So we have a capacitor of some sort between the transmission lines and the uh, the ground. So that's why we need to integrate in our uh, model here, our model circuit, capa uh, a capacitor. Uh, the capacitor is distributed like that at both ends to uh, to replicate more closely the nature of uh, of the the behavior of the transmission line instead of having a, a single capacitor at one end. Of course, this is only for a single phase, but we are sending power through a three phase uh, cable, so three cables. So that's why each phase will have its own representation like that. And each of these segments represents only a short segment of an AC transmission line, because uh, to be able to analyze properly a, a long distance on a transmission line, we need to add up many of these uh, small segments to come up to the equivalent distance that uh, that we need to represent. Okay, so this is our complete AC transmission line here. Uh, when uh, when it comes to uh, this uh, model, uh, this simplified equivalent circuit of a transmission line, we uh, represent it by what we call a pi equivalent. Okay, we, we say that it's a pi equivalent of the circuit because it has the form of the pi letter, Greek uh, pi letter. So uh, if we were to apply directly the values that are measured for a specific distance to these parameter, to these uh, resistors, inductors, and capacitors here, uh, it would not yield exactly the right results. It would not be a faithful model. So we need to do some modification to uh, to get to uh, to the the uh, corrected 
uh, model if you want and that's what we see here on the right side where the same short segment oh sorry no we have one kilometer here one mile here uh, so of course um, sorry I was uh, mis misled in my uh, explanations uh, we I, I do not present these uh, the uh, corrected pi uh, equivalent circuits here so simply what we are presenting here are typical values for one kilometer or one mile of transmission lines. So you can see really low resistance, uh, an inductance which is uh, 10 times as big, and then our capacitors here. So this is for one kilometer and then for one mile. So as you can see, as the distance increase, the capacitance decreases, but of course the resistance and inductance increases. So what is the impact if we connect a load at the other end of this transmission line? So this is our transmission line. So we would connect the load here at the at the end here. So what would be the, what will be the impact of connecting a resistive load here, an inductive load, or a capacitive load on the uh, voltage level that is received at this end? So that's what this graph shows us here. The voltage ER, which is the voltage at the receiver end, so ER voltage at the receiver end, uh, in function of uh, the line current flowing through the line. So as the load increases, the current increases. And as we can see here, uh, this will have a huge impact on the voltage that is received at the other end. So if um, the voltage ES at the sender end here, we can see that even that is uh, is not uh, fixed, okay? The, vo the, the voltage at the sender end, because of the inductive nature of uh, the transmission line, it will have a small fluctuation, but mostly constant. It with no with no load uh, with no load at the other end with or with, without the load at the other end, we will have a s slow uh, change in the voltage at the sending end. But if uh, we connect a capacitive load at the other end of the transmission line, the receiving end, we, we will see that the, re the received voltage will increase as the load increases. So the larger the capacitive load, the more voltage we will get at the receiver end. While with a resistive load, uh, we will have a decrease in uh, received voltage, and for an inductive load, a bigger decrease in received voltage at the other end. Of course, no load is purely capacitive or resistive or inductive, mostly, uh, but uh, so you can imagine a combination of that to, to evaluate the exact voltage we will get at the receiving end. And here we have a, a small mathematical uh, presentation to understand why, why that is, okay? So here we represent our transmission line with a really simplified uh, version, just the inductance, okay? Oftentimes, to analyze the behavior of a transmission line, we can simpl simplify it to just the inductor because, as you saw, the inductance is 10 times as high as the resistance, and the capacitors uh, can be neglected uh, also somewhat. So the inductance is definitely the uh, most impacting uh, part of the transmission line. So as you can see here, we uh, send from the sending end uh, 133 kilovolt uh, voltage that will have a current flow through the inductance here and then to our load. So our load here is constituted of a pure resistive load, okay? So we set, initially we set our load to 10,000 ohms, so a really small load for this transmission line. So now we calculate the impedance of the whole circuit here. So we start with the 10,000 ohm uh, resistance plus the 120 ohm of our inductor, which is here, squared of course, square root of that, we see that the uh, resulting um, impedance of the whole line is really, really close to the resistance of just our load. So, of course, this means that the inductance here will have almost no impact on the received voltage, and we can see that the received voltage uh, will be 133,000 volt as is sent from the sending end, because the current is really low. But now, if we increase our load by decreasing the resistor, resistor value here down to 240 ohm, which is twice, only twice the value of our inductor here, now we will see that our impedance is 268 ohm. With this impedance, we get a load current of 496 amperes instead of 13 amperes that we had here. And of course, this current multiplied by the load, 240, 
will yield a voltage much lower than what we had here and much lower than the, the sender voltage. Now we're down by uh, 14,000 uh, volt uh, because of uh, all of this voltage was lost basically at uh, the inductance level. So we can see that there is a huge impact. The voltage can, uh, the voltage does uh, is not constant at the receiving end, and of course this is not acceptable. The voltage needs to be constant because all of our uh, electrical equipment require a steady source of voltage at 120 volt in North America, 220, 230, 240, depending on the other parts of the world you're in. Uh, so we need to be able to stabilize this voltage at the receiving end. So we need to do, we will do that through voltage compensation. So voltage compensa compensation will be achieved by adding compensating inductors at both ends of the line that will try to compensate for the uh, capacitive nature of the line. And we will be able to remove these compensating inductors de depending on the, the load, so depending on the current that is flowing. So we can see here that by adding compensating inductors that have the same value as the uh, equivalent capa capacitance of our transmission lines, this they will cancel out at each end, and then we will only be left with the inductance here. So what this will yield is that without compensation here, uh, without uh, trying to play with the compensation, so if we have an uncompensated transmission line, as you can see here, we will have uh, at the receiving end, we will have with a short circuit, not a short circuit, but an open circuit, no, uh, no load, we will have a higher voltage at the receiving end as at, uh, higher than the sending end. But as the load increases, the voltage will decrease, 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 eventually it will reach the point where the voltage at the receiving end is equal to the voltage at the sending end. And then if the load keeps increasing, it, it will drop like that. If we add a, our compensating inductors so that they compensate perfectly the line when there is no load, okay, uh, we see that then at the, the receiving end, we will have the exact volt, the same voltage as uh, the sending voltage. But then as the load increases, of course, this will start decreasing like this. So this means that we could probably combine compensated and uncompensated to stay closer to the uh, receiving uh, the uh, descending voltage uh, all along. And that's what is shown here. So initially, we will start with our compensating inductors in the circuit so that uh, right from the start with small loads, we will have a voltage that is really close to the ascending voltage. And then we, when our, the voltage has dropped at the receiving end, to a, a value that we consider too low, then we will remove the compensating inductors. The voltage will drop back up to the uncompensated curve here, and then we will be able to keep increasing the load and uh, and, st uh, and this way coming down low, uh, we, we can go farther on the, uh, on the voltage being close to the 120 volt, or sorry, the uh, sending voltage here before it gets too low. The, before it gets below the minimal volt, voltage limit. So by using a single inductor, we can achieve that. So you can, of course, imagine that if we were using multiple inductors of multiple values, we could have multiple of these steps here, like this, going down and then step up, going down and then step up, going down, so we can stay longer uh, at the receive, at the sending voltage at the receiving end. So before showing you the, uh, the video, the hands-on part of the exercise, uh, here you have a quick uh, image of uh, what these compensating inductors look like in real life. Uh, so uh, this is typical, uh, and we don't see a human here, but the human would be about uh, that high here. So this gives you an idea of the, the size of the thing. And this is only, of course, uh, one uh, bank of uh, three-phase uh, inductors you would have multiple of these banks to be able to adjust properly. So before we present the video, any questions, Gonzalo? No, we have some questions that I already answered, especially the administrative questions and everything going right here. So we can proceed with the video. Perfect, thank you. So I will now show you the first video.
Before making the connections, let's have a look at the full EMS console I have here. So over the last few weeks in the, our webinars, you were introduced to our LVSIM EMS uh, virtual console, which reproduces in the virtual environment this console. Then uh, you had a look at our demo suitcase, which uh, provides a smaller space to demonstrate some of these modules. But now I am beside the full-size uh, uh, console here. So as you can see, you will recognize many of these modules modules from uh, LVSIM and the uh or the demo suitcase. So we have our power supply here with our two three-phase outputs, one fixed, one variable, two DC outputs, one fixed, one variable, our data acquisition module uh, that will allow us to uh, gather, uh, collect the voltage and current data and, every, and calculate everything else starting from this data. Uh, then we have our load modules on the right side here with the capacitive loads, inductive loads, and resistive loads. Um, and then some of our power electronics module that we will be using later on today. So our power thyristor restore module, our IGBT module, and finally our SVC reactor thyristors restore switch capacitor module that will be used uh, expressly for the SVC uh, demonstration that we will be doing later. Oh, and finally, uh, last but not least, the three-phase transmission line module here that will allow us to replicate transmission lines of different length and uh, will allow us to test the voltage regulation on a transmission line and why it is so important. So now let's connect our data acquisition module to the computer and power it so we are able to get measurement out of the system. So the data acquisition module is an electronics module. It needs to be powered with 24 volt AC. And that's why we provide you with a 24 volt output on our power supply module here. So I simply connect the other end of this cable to my data acquisition. And now you can see that it is powered. Then I need to connect it through USB to the computer. So I simply connect this USB cable here to my data acquisition module and the other end of which uh, it's connected to my computer as you can see. The only thing that we need to do now is launch the software that will allow us to communicate with the data acquisition module, which is our LVDAC EMS software here. So as you will see, the first thing that the software does is that it checks on the internet if there is a, a newer version of the software available. It's the case right now. So I am warned about that and I can update it whenever it suits me. Then the software allows me to run either in connected mode or demo mode. Since I am connected to our equipment right now, I want to run in connected mode, of course, to get real experimental data. Finally, the software tells me that it has found a module connected to uh, the computer and that we are ready to go. So clicking OK will bring up the interface of the software that you should now recognize through which we will be able to set up our meters and um, other uh, measuring instruments to be able to uh, record and observe all the uh, experimental data. Let's now see how we can connect all this following the circuit diagram. So the circuit diagram has the source connected to the inductor of the transmission lines, a meter I1 through three banks of resistors here back to the source. And then we have multiple components connected in parallel, voltmeters, capacitors, inductors, and another voltmeter. So leaving the source here, one phase of the power supply, we go up to the first capacitor here. From this capacitor, we go to the transmission line module where we need to uh, set the value to 120 ohm like this with the knob. Out of the transmission line, we go to uh, the second capacitor here, but also go to the parallel compensating inductor here. And out, uh, and also out of this, we go to uh, ammeter I1 here, as you can see. From this ammeter, we go to the resistive loads. Uh, we have the three banks, one of which is connected in series with the other two that are in parallel here. And then finally, uh, out of these uh, resistors, we go back to the neutral of the source that is shared also by this inductor, this capacitor, and this capacitor back to 
the neutral of the source. So the only thing we miss are the two voltmeters. E1 is currently connected between the output of I1 and the neutral of the source, and E2 is connected to the uh, uh, the single phase of our power supply and the neutral also of the source. The only thing that we need to do is make sure that our components are all set to the appropriate values. So as you can see here in our table, um, we have for 120 volt 60 hertz system, which is the North American version I have here, we have the value of the inductor in the transmission line module set to 120 ohm, which I did earlier. Uh, we have the two capacitors that must be set to 1200 ohm by flipping these two switches up. Uh, the inductor that must also be set to 1200 ohm, again switching this uh, switch up, and finally our load which should be infinite initially, so meaning that all switches should be in the down position, which we have now. Good, we're now ready to go. Okay, so now let's power up the system to take some measurements. As you can see in the software here, I have configured the meters to uh, display all the experimental data that I need. So uh, on the left side, I have everything pertaining to the receiving end or the load side of my transmission line with uh, E1 giving us a voltage of 119 volt, uh, the current through the load and the power at the load. So for the moment, there is no power and no current because the load is uh, absent for the moment. I am in a no load condition with infinite resistance. On the sending side or source side, I have, as you can see, the same voltage as on the receiving end. And uh, finally, I have a meter to display the phase shift between the sending and receiving voltage. So before doing uh, the measurements and uh, trying to achieve compensation on our transmission line, let's look at the impact of the load on the voltage at the receiving end. So with no load, we have the same voltage at both ends of our transmission line. But if I start by inserting a small load, like 2400 ohms here, you will see that the voltage barely changed at the receiving end. But as I increase the load, you will see that the voltage quickly drops in step up to a point where the voltage I receive at the receiving end is so low that it is totally unacceptable. As you can see here at around 110 volts, uh, almost 10% below the expected value. So this is to demonstrate that we definitely need to do a compensation to regulate the voltage along our transmission line, especially at the receiving end. So now we will take experimental data that will allow us to trace a graph to better understand what is happening. So to do that, I will bring up our data table tool here that I will configure to uh, record all the data that is currently displayed in my meters. So it's down here. So uh, this data table needs to be configured to record the exactly the data you want. And I remind you that you absolutely need to make sure that the data you want to record is currently displayed somewhere in the software. So either in the metering window, the oscilloscope window, or something like that. So if the data is displayed, it can be recorded. So then we go to record settings and you will see that by default, the data table provides us with the list of meters and data that is currently displayed and it's already, already selected for us. So if you want to record everything that is displayed, just click OK and it will be done. So now we have the five columns to record the five pieces of experimental data that we are interested in. So let's start with the values that are currently displayed corresponding to a no load condition. So I will just hit the record data button here, and this is recorded for our initial point. Then we will start increasing the load, recording the, the, the experimental data at each step. So at this value, at 2400, then 1200 ohms, then constantly decreasing the value of the resistance, so increasing the load. Eventually, we will reach a point 
where our voltage is too low and we need to compensate it. Of course, this is dependent on your choice of what is unacceptable, but let's say that for the moment at around 113, 114 volt, we will consider that as totally unacceptable. So this is the point where we need to remove the uh, inductance, uh, the uh, un compensating inductance that we have in the circuit that's there since the beginning. So if I remove this inductance from the circuit, you will see that the receiving voltage jumps back up to 124, 25 volt. So now I can keep increasing my, my load uh, since I am back above the uh, expected voltage at the other end. So if I start with that here, then increase the load again and again, and finally one less value. Now we're back to almost the uh, expected voltage at 122 volt at the receiving end. So let's say that this is enough data for us to trace a uh, valuable graph. So we will just shut off the power here and now uh, make a graph of uh, this data. Of course, there are multiple graphs we could uh, trace, but the one we are interested in is the uh, voltage at the receiving end in uh, relation to the load or the active power in this case. So to do that, you can use the integrated graphing tool, graphic tool that is there, or you can export the data to uh, Excel format, CSV, and uh, use Excel uh, graphic tool to, uh, to trace your graphs. So let's use the integrated graph here. So I just need to specify what I want to be displayed. So I would like to see the E1 voltage in relation to the active power like this and as you can see there is an automatic scaling that is done by the software if you're not satisfied with it you can simply uh, change to manual mode here so we want to, to display between uh, let's say 80 volt which is below the lowest value to 140 at the top and I want steps of five for more precision. And same thing in X, I will rescale it from zero to 40 watts for the active power with intervals of five again. So this is a usable graph. And as you can see, this graph definitely shows us that uh, our voltage needed to be regulated. So we started at 120, went down, down to 115, 114, when we decided to remove the compensating inductor, jumping back up to 125 and then dropping again. So of course, this is much too crude a control for uh, a real power grid, but the goal is to show that indeed with uh, inductors in parallel with our loads, we are able to achieve compensation. So the next step in the exercise, and that's what is done in the manual, uh, is to uh, take a bank of inductors and a bank of capacitors working in parallel to be able to achieve a much finer control. So switching in and out the inductors and capacitors at the right moment to maintain the voltage at the receiving end within one volt of uh, the expected 120 volt, of course, or 220 volt if uh, you are outside of North America. So uh, this is the next step in the manual, but for us, for today, we will conclude this exercise here on voltage regulation on transmission lines uh, with manual means, so manual compensation, and we will switch to the smart grid technology, which is called static VAR compensation, uh, that will perform automatically the voltage regulation on the line with a much finer control and much quicker response also. Good. So I hope everybody was able to watch the video properly. Uh, yeah, we were able to watch the video. So I... For our viewers, you may want to close. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. That's it. So, uh, yeah, hopefully no technical problems. You were able to get the image and the sound properly. So, uh, are there any questions, Gonzalo? 
Not yet, I don't see here anything in the in the chat, just a request for the link of the video. I told that the video and all the video of the whole webinar will be sent 24 hours later. So that will be tomorrow. Uh, yes. Yep. Perfect. Okay, so, yeah, we can... Sorry? Yep, we can keep on going. There are some questions here, but I can handle them. Okay. So uh, this is what we just saw. Now we uh, attack the second part of the presentation about uh, voltage compensation of an AC transmission line using an SVC or static VAR compensator. Uh, so the discussion will go through uh, voltage compensation using an SVC, uh, the different types of SVCs, uh, the TCR-FC and TCR-TSC, and uh, then we will have the hands-on part where we look at the automatic voltage compensation. So what is SVC? So as the name implies, static VAR. So uh, we, we will have a... Uh, uh, oh, I think that rain started outside. Sorry, let's close the window. Uh, okay. So uh, you will see that, uh, whoops, here, uh, static VAR compensation. So we will be using uh, capacitors that will provide us with uh, VARs or reactive power, and we will be able to compensate our transmission line with that. But of course, uh, we will need also to modulate this amount of uh, uh, reactive power provided by the capacitors by combining them with an inductor. So what you can see here is at the top, we have our transmission line. Again, this is a, a single line uh, diagram, but you must imagine that this is all multiplied by three for the three phases, but for a single phase, that's what it looks like. So uh, we have our transmission line with our load at one end. And then in parallel with that, we have our SVC or static bar compensator itself. So first of all, as you can see, the SVC will be connected to the transmission line through a step-down transformer because it will be much too uh, hard in terms of electronics and everything to be able to manage 100 kilovolts. So we just step down uh, really a lot the voltage from the uh, transmission line to be manageable by the SVC. And we do that through a transformer that is connected in Y delta, so the primary is in Y and the secondary is in delta to uh, try to eliminate as much as possible the third harmonics that we will get out of our uh, static VAR compensator. So this is for harmonics reason. Uh, part, uh, that's one of the reasons that we use this Y delta connection or uh, star delta connection. Uh, then uh, here we will have in our SVC will be composed, as you can see, of uh, fixed capacitors of a one, in this case, one fixed capacitor of 100 me megabar, then two uh, switched capacitors of 100 megabar each. So as you can see, these can be inserted or not in the circuit. And finally, a variable inductor that can change from zero megabar to uh, 120 megabar. So why use a variable inductor combined with capacitors instead of just using variable capacitors? Well, it's simply because uh, Technically, it's really difficult to uh, produce a reliable variable capacitor. So the capacitors are fixed in nature, and then a variable inductor is really easy to do. So we will just build an inductor that will allow us to compensate or absorb some of the reactive power that is produced by the capacitors. So the two working in tandem will be able to achieve any uh, value of reactive power we need. So, of course, uh, in the previous uh, schematic, we were showing uh, a simple switch, but we want that to be controllable electronically. So uh, we want to be able to insert these capacitors electronically. So the way we will do that is that we will connect the uh, power restore switched capacitors, the, the switch capacitors through a uh, SSR here, a solid state relay that, uh, made of tire stores that will allow us to uh, either uh, fully uh, turn on our thyristors restores to, uh, to connect the capacitor to the, uh, to the SVC, the rest of the SVC, or uh, switch off completely the thyristors restores so that the capacitor is cut off from the circuit. So this really acts as a, a solid state relay here. 
for the fire for the reactor the, that's the name we give to the inductor in this uh, technology the thyristor controlled reactor so for the uh, inductor we will also have a pair of a of a thyristors controlling connecting it to, to the rest of the circuit except that these thyristors will not be all, either on or off they will be we will continually control the firing angle we send to these thyristors to get the exact amount of current flowing through the inductor to produce the amount of reactive, to absorb the amount of reactive power we want. So that, for example, if this is, a, so if we go back to our circuit here, we had a, an inductor going from a zero to 120 megavar. So if this capacitor is on, uh, this capacitor is always on. So with this inductor, I can com completely uh, cancel out this capacitor and then even absorb more reactive power than what is provided by this capacitor by going to the full 120. Then if we switch in this capacitor, then we have 200 megavar. This uh, inductor will be able to absorb 120 megavar of this 200. So as you can see, we will be able to have a continuous uh, range of uh, uh, reactive power that we can produce with this SVC. Here is the schematic for the full three phase. So uh, just showing a small part because as you can see, this could become really cluttered quickly. So just for the reactor part, the uh, thyristor uh, controlled reactor part. So we see that each reactor or each inductor is connected to a pair of thyristors and they are connected in a delta pattern like this. And all these thyristors of course will receive the uh, same firing signal, the same angle uh, so that the, the all pro, each reactor provides the same uh, amount of reactive power. Finally, a presentation of a actual SVC station here in a substation. So we have multiple parts to this. I won't go into details, but uh, mostly here you can see that these are the TCRs, so the thyristor controlled reactors. Uh, the thyristor switched capacitors are right here. And the, uh, in the nine here are the thyristor valves. So these are the, the inductors. And in this building are the valves or the thyristors controlling the amount of power flowing through the, these inductors. Then of course, a bunch of other components that uh, we don't uh, really have time to discuss here. So there are two different types of uh, uh, SVCs, the FC type for fixed capacitor type. So as you can see, we have multiple fixed capacitors, uh, uh, fixed capacitors here and one big TCR here. So I say big because this TCR must be able to compensate most, if not all of these capacitors. So it has to be three times or two times uh, the, the, the size in, in, VAR, in terms of VARs uh, as these uh, capacitors here. So this is the uh, drawback of this technology because uh, it requires a really large inductor, but the, we will achieve then a control that looks like that. So you can see here that uh, in blue is the line of the, is the amount of reactive power uh, absorbed by uh, by the uh, inductor, and we start from this level here with all of our capacitors uh, in the circuit. So we start with a really low level of uh, reactive power here, uh, the SVC supplying reactive power. And then if we want to supply less reactive power, then we will increase the current flowing through our inductors, which will absorb some of this reactive power here, so that eventually we will reach a point where we uh, provide no reactive power at all. And then if we keep increasing the current flowing through our thyristor, uh, we will even absorb more reactive power than what the capacitors can provide. The second technology is the TSC type for thyristor switch capacitors. So as you can see, these are thyristor switch capacitors. So we will be able to insert them uh, in and out depending on if we trigger the thyristors or not. And then with this, we don't have to compensate the full uh, bank of three capacitors with our inductor. The inductor must only be able to compensate a single bank because each bank will be added uh, sequentially. So this will yield something like that. So when the three capacitors are in the circuit, then our inductor can change its value like that to compensate up to its maximum. Then we switch out 
the, the third bank of capacitor, then we have only two. We compensate the, from two to one. Then we switch out the second. We have only the one bank of capacitor. We compensate it. And finally, when no capacitors are in the circuit, we uh, okay. we can uh, absorb more reactive power with ion inductor. So this is the circuit that we will be using in the upcoming hands-on exercise. So we will have our power supply providing three-phase power connected to a three-phase load. And all of that will be connected in parallel with our SVC, which will be implemented with our SVC module. Uh, this is the view from the software that you will see in a moment. Uh, and you notice here three buttons uh, in this uh, interface, show connections, controller diagram, and uh, show SCADA view. So the show connections button will provide this. So this is for the students to, if they are mixed up and don't know how to connect things, uh, well, of course, this is not easy to read, but still it's better than nothing. Uh, they can see that this wire goes from here to here, and this wire goes from there to there. So this, this is to help them uh, connect the modules together. Uh, then it's possible to, uh, by clicking on the controller diagram, to look at the logic inside that is used inside. So as you can see, uh, we use the Clark's transformation and Parks transformation to come up with the proper value for our um, our line volt voltage uh, compensation here. That will be compared to the line voltage command command uh, to be uh, to go through our PI amplifier we have control on the proportional and integral parameter to see how our uh, system responds to a variation in voltage and this the output of this will go to the TCR so the reactors the inductors and the two banks of capacitors uh, tire star switch capacitors and finally, the last button is the SCADA view. So we can switch to a SCADA view of the same circuit where we see the voltages and currents in uh, the proper location. Okay. So Christian, before getting to the video, maybe yeah. one question, and I think we may want to go back some slides. We yeah. have a question that is, what is the value of millivar capacitance in terms of microfarad capacitance? So I what think is the what is the value okay. of in megavar capacitance in terms of microfarad capacitance? The value of megavar. Oh well, okay. Uh, it's we are we are in the range of um, uh, so the capacitance is the inverse of the uh, the capacitance is the inverse. So as you get lower. Uh, lower in farad value, you will get a higher var uh, value for your capacitor. I don't know if that answers the question. I cannot come up with a, uh, a uh, uh, numeric uh, answer, but uh, as you know, the, indu the inductance, uh, the, uh, the reactance of a capacitor is inversely proportional to its capacitance. So if you want to produce more reactive power, you need to have a lower uh capacitance but uh, i i wouldn't know in terms of uh farad what what is the value of these capacitors so i'm sorry uh, i don't know the i usually always work with uh, uh, low power electronics so i don't know the value of these capacitors that they use uh, in uh, in these uh, svcs okay the, thanks for the answer and we can go to the video Perfect. On my right, you can see the amount of connections that are required for this uh, circuit. So as you can see, it's a little bit more involved than uh, what we just had with our uh, manual voltage regulation circuit on the AC transmission lines. So of course, uh, lots of electronics is required here. We have the TCRs, we have the TSCs, uh, the uh, monitoring equipment to, uh, to check, to read all the data here. And of course, our three-phase load and three-phase transmission lines. So uh, let's look at the schematic and see how this uh, parallels what we see in the circuit diagram. 
So first of all, as you can see, what we see there is uh, simply the first part of the schematic because uh, the circuit is so large that it doesn't fit on a single page. So we have our uh, power three-phase power source, the three-phase transmission line module, and then the three-phase uh, resistive load on the right-hand side. But from there, we have four lines, A1, A2, A3, A4, that go down to the next page where we will see the power electronics section of the circuit. So first of all, A1, A2, A3, A4 arrive here on the left side, connected to the primary of our uh, transistor, of our transformer, sorry. And the uh, and this, these primaries are connected in uh, Y, as you can see, y, while the uh, secondaries are connected in delta. Then the three phase line out of this uh, of the secondaries are going to the the TCR here and the two TSCs, all of them in parallel with one another. So let's see how this is implemented here on the system. Whoops. So starting with this one here, leaving the power supply, the three phase power supply with these three blue lines, we go up to the transmission line module here. Out of the transmission line module, we have one line that goes to the ammeter and come back here. The other ones are going directly to the three phase load here, which are connected in Y, as you can see. Uh, and then the, uh, the other line out of the transmission line, the other three lines are going down to the primaries of the three phase transformers that are here. The second, the uh, the other end of the uh, of these uh, primaries are connected in uh, Y. Believe me, if you, even if you don't see it here, and uh, that's it. For on the secondary side, if we go down to the second part of the schematic, it will be easier for you to follow. So the primaries connected in Y, the secondaries connected in delta. Once again, I assure you that's the case. And then leaving from the secondaries, we have these three red wires coming down here to the thyristor module. So the thyristor module, just like our IGBT module, comprises six uh, thyristors that can be connected individually or in pairs. That's what we have here, each pair here is uh, connected to one of these uh, phases uh, out of the secondary of the transformer. The other end of these, uh, of these pairs of thyristors is connected here through these wires here. You can see that they are connected on the left side of the SVC reactor thyristor switched uh, capacitors here. In fact, they are connected to the three inductors that are here on the left side to be able to control the amount of current flowing through these uh, inductors. And finally, uh, the three pairs of thyristors are also connected, in fact, in parallel with the uh, transformers uh, and uh, in parallel with the TSCs. So we have the two TSCs here that are connected here. Uh, finally, of course, the neutral of uh, the uh, of the source is shared. So the neutral that comes here on this red wire is shared uh, by the uh, primaries of the, uh, no, sorry. Yes, by the primaries of the transformers and by the resistive uh, load here. That's it for the power connections. The, uh, then we have a couple of control connections that are required also. So we need to be able to send a signal to the TSCs here to turn them on or off or insert them in the circuit or not. And these control signals will come from uh, the data acquisition module here, digital output one and two of the uh, data acquisition module will be sent to TSC one and two uh, here inputs on our uh, TSC uh, module. And finally, the thyristors, of course, need to be controlled also, and they will receive their uh, triggering signal also from the uh, data acquisition module through this DB9 cable that we already used last week when we presented uh, our uh, choppers and inverter circuits uh, as part of the power electronics course. So this same DB9 cable is used here to send the six triggering signals to our thyristors. That's it for the connections. We're ready to start the experiment. 
Let's now proceed with the experiment and take some measurements. So you will see that I have pre-configured LVDAC here to display all the information I'm interested in. So the two voltages at the source uh, sending and receiving end, the current through the load and the reactive power exchange between the SVC and the circuit. Our data table is configured also to record E2, I2, the reactive power, the firing angle we send to our thyristor restore to control. Thy restores to control the amount of reactive power they consume. And finally, the state of our two TSCs. So are they in or out of the circuit? The static VAR compensator control window here that you have access to through the DACI menu with SVC control here. Uh, is uh, gives us access to the automatic voltage control function that you see here. When we are in this mode, we have to set the line voltage command, so at what voltage we want the, the SVC to keep uh, the value uh, at the receiving end, and the uh, pr proportional and integral parameter that uh, you have access to to control how the controller responds to any changes. So these default values are really good, but you can play with that to see how it impacts the controller behavior. So let's power up the system and see how the SVC achieves control. So right from the start, you can see that with the low load we have right now, 1200 ohms per phase, uh, we don't have the expected voltage at the receiving end. Uh, the SVC is not in the circuit, of course, yet. By the way, the voltage we see here is the line voltage, while the command that we have specified here is the phase voltage, and that's the difference that explains the difference you see here. So let's turn on our SVC function here to see how it will correct the situation. So you can see now that our receiving voltage is exactly 209 volt. That uh, the SVC achieved that by turning on the first bank of capacitor and sending a firing angle of uh, 105 degrees to our inductors. So let's record this first set of value in our data table here and then start changing the uh, value of our load. By the way, you might see that the two last columns haven't been recorded automatically because the this is a status that is not available for recording. I need to input it by hand. So here we see that TSC1 is in while TSC2 is out. So let's go to the second line, change my load to 600 ohms like this record the new set of value and you will see that the firing angle has increased tsc1 and tsc2 are still in the same state so in and out the voltage remains at 209 at the load so let's go to 400 here so this will be um, like this here so 400 ohms Record, our firing angle still increasing, TSC1 and 2 still in and out respectively. Then let's go to 400 ohms, uh, 300, sorry. 300, record, still 209 volt, 135 degrees for our firing angle and still in and out here. Then from 300, we will go to 240, like this. Record. And now you see that TSC2 has been inserted in the circuit, which allows the uh, firing angle to go back down to, uh, in fact, uh, have the inductors absorb more reactive power. Uh, so as we increase the firing angle, the uh, inductors absorb less and less reactive power. But then since we insert a new bank of capacitors, they need to uh, absorb more to absorb uh, some of the reactive power provided by the second bank. So that's why the firing angle decreases. So now I can input here that both my uh, banks are, whoops, not out, both are in. like this. And finally, one last value. We will go to uh, this, which is 200. Record that. And again, we can see that the both TNCs are in. 
and uh, we have our we started increasing the firing angle perfect so we can see that this behaves exactly as we are expecting and we can see that the control the control seems really fast but how fast exactly is it well let's see that with the oscilloscope so we will now bring up the oscilloscope and configure it to um, to record a specific event so let's let me come back to a uh, load of a specific value here and I will bring up the oscilloscope and configure it to record a momentary event at the moment it happens so to be able to record this momentary event on the oscilloscope I uh, set it to the time base to 0.1 second per division which I know will yield good uh, results uh, I set my trigger type to hardware to tell basically the oscilloscope to wait for a specific a hardware event a current event to uh, start uh, recording I will wait uh, for this event on channel 1 which is my E2 voltage the receiving voltage and I set the level that should trigger the event as 305 volt 305 volt is just above the peak voltage that I have on my uh, line voltage there uh, and it, I, know, I know I will get the peak voltage when I change the load and this is the, the moment I want to record the data then I put the oscilloscope in single refresh mode here by clicking on the single refresh and then the oscilloscope waits for the event to happen so what I have set up here is that I have a resistance of 240 ohm on ohms on each of my phase and I will uh, switch it to 1200 ohms so decreasing the uh, increasing the resistance and the decreasing uh, the load uh, in one step and normally the oscilloscope should record that here that's exactly what happened as you can see so now we can uh, see what happened before the trigger and after the trigger because I have set my trigger point here I, I slided it uh, here along my x-axis to be here so I could see before and after the trigger so you can see that before the tr trigger we had constant voltage then at the moment that I flipped uh, the uh, that I changed my uh, load I got a peak of voltage here and immediately after this peak of voltage you can see that TSC2 was taken out of the circuit because it, it was not required anymore and that's what we wanted to record to see how fast uh, the SVC was reacting so we can see that within a single cycle the TSC has had been taken out of the circuit and then in the following three four five cycles the firing angle on the tire stores was adjusted to reach after five or six cycle cycles reach again the the voltage that we are expecting which is 209 volt so we can see that the SVC is reacting really fast uh, and really precisely maintaining the uh, voltage at the receiving end within a uh, few volts of the uh, expected voltage and it does that in a few milliseconds so that was the goal of this uh, exercise here this demonstration to show you uh, how uh, fast uh, and precise an SVC can uh, can control the uh, voltage and to show you how this uh, equipment here can be used to teach these topics to your students thank you okay so sorry we went a bit over again over time uh, tonight uh, today and this morning uh, five minutes so do we have any questions uh, Gonzalo <laughs> Uh, no, we don't have any questions. Everything is clear. Just uh, two messages of uh, giving uh, their thanks. Everything okay. was clear. So Super. I think uh, in my case, I have an answer for the person who asked about the value of these uh, capacitors. While uh, the video was playing, I did some math. Uh, and uh, thanks, thanks for asking the question. It uh, allowed me to do... Uh, uh, some uh, to, to increase my knowledge uh, also so uh, basically I went to the ABB site and has, because they are providing uh, these SVC stations 
and they are one of the players and uh, looked at the specs of their SVC capacitors and they say that they, uh, they work on 115 kilovolt voltage uh, for a 100 megavar, um, 100 megavar capacity. So I simply found the current out of that, which is uh, around 900 uh, amps. And with this current and the voltage, I was able to found the uh, reactants and then the uh, capacitance of the inductor. So these inductors are around 20 uh, microfarad, okay, 20 microfarad. But of course, they are of huge, huge uh, uh, volume to be able to handle and a huge uh, dielectric uh, space to be able to handle that kind of uh, voltages. But uh, the, uh, the value, uh, the capacitance value of the capacitors is in the same range as what we're used to uh, in a small electronic circuit. It's just that the power handling capacity of the capacitor is much higher. So hopefully the person was still there to uh, hear the answer. Yes, and, uh, in uh, just says, thanks, sir. It's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Thank you for attending again uh, today, this uh, webinar. Uh, just one last poll, if you're still there, to help us uh, again uh, improve. Uh, if you can tell us if this uh, webinar was useful to you. If, uh, you could use that with your students. And, uh, and meanwhile, while you answer, you answer, I remind you that next week we will have another topic completely different and we go, well, completely somewhat related. We go to our, um, uh, our uh, suitcase that we have, uh, which allows teaching uh, VFDs, so variable frequency, frequency drive, more on the technical side of things, so more about how to use a VFD and how to program it to achieve the results, to get the results we want. So this will be the topic of uh, next week. So please again, uh, join us for this uh, webinar if it is of interest to you. Thank you. And again, thank you to you, uh, Gonzalo, for joining us tonight. My pleasure. So have a good, uh, have a good day or a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.